What is up guys and welcome back to the comic shop. It is BZ Comics and in this one from Bungie's game Destiny and Destiny 2 I'm gonna be showing you guys how I made this pretty cool K6 helmet yeah, Me too kiddo But hey I'm here now Wherever the hell here is Zavala's doing the hero thing in the plaza. Me? I've got a date with whoever's behind this. It'll be a short date. This file here is from DO3D. Now they have a lot of pretty interesting files aside from just this one. Primarily if you're looking for anything, Marvel, Star Wars, DC, even Iron Man suits or most of the suits that you see people 3D printing, this is going to be the site to get them from. Now yes, you do see that some of these helmets do charge or they do have a fee for most of their helmets. But they do have a free section for you as well. They didn't have this blue beetle helmet up there before, but they did add it. So I would definitely say get to it if it's something that you wanted. But I do have a, an affiliate link down below in the description of this video. If you are looking to purchase one of these helmets and you do use my affiliates link, thank you. And my way of thanking you is going to be sending you a 20% discount code. So if one of these helmets are something that you want to make, again, just DM me. I'll send you the 20%. Just make sure you use my code and we'll all be happy. <laughs> and I know this looks like one good solid print. Looks like you could just go ahead and spray paint and go from there. But there were a couple different cuts that I had to make to the file to actually get to this point. I have to add some LED eyes and the helmet is a little bit baggy. So I'm going to have to show you guys how to fix that as well. Besides that, enough of me talking. Let's get into how I sliced this file to get exactly to this point. Let's get to it boom so you paid the money you got the file download it now we got we're going to get into the scaling and how to make this actually fit so no this isn't like me talking to you through the headset with my face in the screen i didn't like virtually jump into the computer i actually got a free scan of my head using scandy pro definitely check this video out here in the top right this is a free app that you can use from any iphone and again it's going to save you a lot of guesswork because i no longer have to scale my head with either like closing my head in a door and trying to see like the difference measuring tape anything like that and then it still might come out a little bit weird because I didn't get like every piece of my head this scale is a hundred percent accurate it's the right size it's literally me and the computer <laughs> the good thing about the DO3D files as well is that they use a mannequin instead of my head just imagine a mannequin so that's how they basically sculpt all of their helmets so for me, depending on your head size and depending if you have hair, so on and so forth, depending on what you call an average head size as well. For myself, I see either 103 to 105 with the uniform scaling on. That's something that fits to my head. Again, with this scale helping and with knowing that most of their 100% models, if you have like a bald head or anything like that, normal size head, like you know when you pick up a hat what your head looks like. <laughs> Um, but yeah, typically if you have a typical size head, um, you'll notice that these prints at 100% work perfectly fine just like that. Again, if you have hair or maybe have maybe a bigger head, no judgment at all. <laughs> um, you might want to do this scale so that way you can figure out the exact measurements. But again, for me, 105 works perfectly. And boom, from there. Now the difference between these two slices that you'll notice is this is Creality Print other than Cura. You know with Cura, I can't slice, I can't do a lot of the, the mixing around, messing around with the mesh or anything like that. It kind of is what it is. You slice it, it's done. Here with uh, Creality Print, I get a whole bunch more options. So it's like they updated it. So I can add clones. I can add letters. I can make a cut, which I used to use Slicer.org for, which was terrible. I can mir mirror it. I can create drills. Now, I, I know a lot of you guys will say, hey, there was already slices that can do that. Well. I'm on a Mac, so I'm kind of limited. Now getting into why I'm cutting cutting this, one, it's because I want to like save a little bit of filament. As you guys know, I print a lot of helmets very frequently, so I'm trying to get the most out of each roll. And two, again, it's to show you guys and help you guys out as well, because I know a lot of you guys don't have a build volume the size of the K1 Max. Some of you guys might be starting up with something smaller, so on and so forth there's a lot of situations where even if you do have a big printer that you're still going to have to make cuts so i try to teach you where and how to make cuts so that way you're not like affecting your print or like messing up line not, nothing like that so for me the main my main focus on this helmet was to kind of get it to print up straight 
without this back scoop. Now if you've seen the Green Goblin video that I did, I know automatically that this scoop is doable, like you can 100% do this, but I just feel like it's going to take a little bit more time and there's going to be a ton of supports that go back into this further region. So instead of doing that, this is kind of where I plan to make this cut to save from that. So let's go ahead and do that. Boom! Like butter. <laughs> Now this jaw, the front of the helmet, I could print out just like this, but my main concern was these little eye holes. I felt like without there being a little bit of support in there that that would have came out a little off and I really didn't want that in the face of the helmet. So I just put supports on this front, but as you can see from the dome, the back scoop, that didn't need supports and some of the other parts didn't as well. Now let me show you guys with this cool time lapse how I set everything else up. Let's get to it. Okay, so now we got through the first tough question is how do you scale helmets to make them actually fit? Now, the second biggest question that I get after that is how do you sand rough 3D prints or how do you sand prints to make them look smooth? Don't think you want to know the answer to that. What are these? Japanese sanda. What do you do with them? Funny you should ask. Because it's a little bit of elbow grease and a lot of hard work. Class is in session. Okay, so now we're getting into more of the manual labor part. We're getting into the sanding. Now, there's no real brand that I recommend over the other. The only thing that I can really mention is what grit you're starting out with. Now, if you have something with a lot more imperfections, a print that doesn't come out like this smooth, that maybe has like a couple rough surfaces like you see under here, something like that, I would start off with 80 grit. For PLA Plus, I feel like 80 grit to start out with works beautifully. It makes everything to the same layer and consistency and it works great with, with your primers to start out with. Since this doesn't have a lot of imperfections, again, this is smooth to the touch. It's already looking like glass. Again, my main focus here is just to make this tack in for the primer to actually go on. So from here, I'm just gonna start out with the 220 and then work up to a 400 grit, 400 grit sandpaper from there. And just a quick tip for sanding, what I say, one of the two, best, two of the best methods that I would either say is to either go against the grain. So as you can see, the print lines are going left to right along the whole print. So I would go up and down just to create a different contrast, just to make sure that you're getting all those grooves. Now, again, with the sanding block, that makes it a lot better because as you're doing that, you're getting an even surface because as you see, this is a big surface opposed to just like your hand. Besides that, young Danielson, small circles. Left the circle, <laughs> right the circle. Left, right the circle. Left the circle. Wait, wouldn't it be easier going back and forth? Aye, 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 but you go circle. Now the good thing about sanding is even when you think you're done, you're not. <laughs> but now basically from here, as you can see the small little particles that dust up or acquire up from sanding, basically you want to wash and clean this off so that way you don't have any of that and then start priming from there. So usually what I do is I'll just go through the first go of sanding, clean it all off 
and then let the primer reveal everything that's going to show from there. And then when it comes to primer, typically what I'll do is I'll start off with this two-in-one filler primer because it goes on a lot tackier and like I said, it's going to reveal a lot more of the smaller imperfections that I have to get. And I feel like when I sand with that, the smaller particles that come off from this primer really get into the smaller nicks and really just like finish and coat everything perfectly. From there, I finish off with the flat gray primer, but this time I'm going to be starting with the flat gray primer because as you can see, I'm all out of the other stuff. So this flat gray primer really works as like the end coat because it just goes on flat gray. So it really gets the face of everything or the final layer of your print gets it really smooth and ready for paint basically I really like the finish of it but for this time I'm just gonna use this to knock everything down but before we do that let's go ahead and rinse it off and then take it off for priming okay challenge John, John I know you guys favorite part is the paint seeing the LEDs and seeing it all finish but before we get to that there's just one more thing one more thing picture of tortoise shell The symbol So as you remember in the beginning of the video we had made some cuts of our own. Not only that, the helmet did come in not only the front piece but the back piece as well. And although the back piece does have some magnet ports, these are kind of small magnet ports. And as you can see with just duct tape, just holding the helmet all together, it already fits as one. So I don't really need to add the magnet ports to make it pop on and pop off. That's why like I said, making it a little bit bigger does help. So we're gonna get into soldering this together and lining some foam in there, and then we'll get you apart the paint. <laughs> Wrong hero. So basically what I'm doing here is I turn the temperature down a lot lower. So this is about a three. And as you can see the two sides, I'm just gently going over and just making them one. So you can see how easily they're coming together, just blending in. Again, this is the part that everybody's gonna see. So my main thing is just to close this line and then on the inside, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna turn the heat up to about a five. That way I can start doing more of the bracing on the inside. So the inside is what solidifies the bond. The outside, I'm just making sure all my lines connect. Now, as you can see, there is a slight little deviation. That's because it's best for me to do this without recording, because I can get like a better angle. But with recording, it, that doesn't make a difference. The piece still fits in. If I needed to, I can always just take the solder and iron, cut these two, and open it up. You never know the difference, but that's another tip that um, soldering is good for to realign things and cut things and weld things and just being creative. So I prefer to use cheap, easy duct tape, but you can use clamps to hold these in place. Whatever works for you. Again, this is just a simple process for me. Now, from the end of the print, you usually get like these little, I don't know, like a little brim on the inside. And that's perfect for this because it actually, again, helps bracing on the inside. So again, I turn up the heat a lot more from here. And from here, you can just like kind of go crazy. Still bringing those two lines together. But like I said, you can go a lot deeper so that way everything is safe and secure.
you haven't seen the blaze of chaos video i would highly recommend that you check that video up at the top right but in that video i show you how i use liquid painter's tape basically to cover off certain portions of the helmet so that way i can keep a certain color so what i'm going to do for this one is there are a lot of weathering effects a lot of damage that you can see on this helmet check this reference image out here it's basically the reference reference image that i'm using and what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint this silver as the base coat. And then I'm going to use some liquid painter's tape on certain parts of the helmet that I want to stay the silver. And then I'm going to come over with the final coats of color and then peel that off. It's a very satisfying process. Let's get to it. Okay, I probably know what you're saying. None of that really stuck and you can't see any of the silver. I should have basically just used blue painter's tape and just like use it as the strips there are different millimeter sizes that you can get that painter's tape so i should have just used some of it and just made like pinstripes and just went off like that but i've just been wanting to add new strategies that i can show you guys to implement into your into your process so it's still a good part to watch but as you can see i didn't stick with it just because i didn't really like the way that it looked at the end back to the video So when it comes to weathering, you're really, there's no like method to it. It's just, you want to create like a natural effect. So nature is random. So there's no like straight lines that I'm trying to achieve. There's no like certain point where I'm trying to get and certain point where I'm trying to miss. I want it to look more like a natural effect, like it's damaged, like it's been through something. So on this side, you can see it's starting to dry a lot more. So like I said, if I feel like I need to go a little bit more than that, then I will. But as you can see, this is already kind of like just with those, the way those little patches are looking in it, you can already tell like it's going to tell a different story. It gives another level to the mask. Bang, bang. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, this one is a wrap. So I hope you guys did enjoy this helmet. As you can see, a lot of my helmets now have been moving away from like the DC and kind of comic book hero. And as you notice, I've been getting more into like pop culture stuff, a lot of more movies and TV shows. And coming with that, we're going to be moving into more of the electronics, more of the DIY part of stuff. Basically, what my goal is, is just like I've been mentioning to you guys a lot for a long time, is to get a little bit, I think a lot of my videos are kind of getting that same feeling to it. It's like 
okay, he sanded it, he printed it, he did this. Yes, I have added the time lapses and a couple of new different things for you guys to like watch and learn from. But again, I wanted to get in more, more into programming, more into the aesthetics and make the helmet actually do something or make the prop actually do something. As you can see, I have plenty of different helmets, more helmets that I can actually <laughs> store. So I want to get into more stuff like robotics and things like that and just have a little bit of fun with it, which I'm pretty sure you guys will have a lot of fun with as well. But in the meantime, that's a wrap for this video. Stay tuned for what's coming next. As always, I always have a sneak peek for you guys. Besides that, as always, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for being a part of the family. It's BZ Comics. Peace.